Hi everyone, my name is Andrei Sitnik and today I will explain like how and why we as a developer can care about the user's privacy. And you know, in the reality, a lot of people like will ask, like who cares about the privacy? Like let's keep, uh, let's keep code out of the politics. But you know, this is a good topic. Let's speak about the software industry and the principles. So like we are on the open source conference and open source is not about to use your like software for free. Open source is about to be able for you to control your own device, to really own it, not just use it. And it's pretty political. All the cryptography, cryptography, like that S in HTTPS links is not just a letter. It was the idea that like uh, protocols which we created really will affect the society we live tomorrow. And it's pretty political as well. Or like hacking, not like a criminal, but like, you know, people who do hacks. The hacker ethic contains a very important idea of mistrust authority, which is really political as well. So software developer was always about the politics. It's only like a new idea that, you know, we need to work in Silicon Valley and make some money. Because just at like a 20 years ago, society see us completely different. Society see us as a, like a people who uh, fight with the system, not helping the system. Okay, but like why you should care about the privacy of the users? Because first reason, you know, you create the world where you will live. And you know, like if you create a tool which like grab the screen of the workers to ensure that they work like full day, like year after you will, the, uh, your employee will use it against you. Second reason is that principles create meaning of life. The materialistic way of see the world cannot answer the main question, why? And unfortunately only like uh, principles can give you this answer. But uh, there is a lot of principles, there is a lot of revolutions to make and I can't like, there is no way to explain why one principle is better than another one. But I will try to at least explain why I care about the privacy. So like there is a common idea that you know, privacy is not important because all this like surveillance, it's f just for Google to make a better advertisement. And it's not reality. Because the main problem here is data brokers. Data brokers is a company which buy a lot of uh, private data from, user, from multiple apps, combine them and resell as like a combined items to very shady clients. And there is a very good example for it. Just a four years ago, a journalist found a very creepy case when a data, blocker, data broker called Xmode, it collect data from Quran app, from Muslim dating apps, from Craigslist, very popular app, and they'll sell it to the US military contractor. For me, it's extremely shady. Okay, but like, it's a bad company, it's a small company, but I'm working in the company which really care about user privacy and we don't sell our data. You know, this is not really the truth because in reality there is an important thing called data leaks or data breaches. In reality, you could not sell it, but still this, mark, this data will be, your data will be on the market because one simple uh, intrusion and all this data could be leaked to the internet. There is a very good example for it. Uh, Yandex Food Delivery, it's a Russian Uber Eats. In just two years ago, uh, somebody leaked the uh, all deliveries data for the whole year to internet. And this data include uh, your number, like your, your name, your phone number, the food delivery address and delivery time. Uh, imagine how, like a funny part, they even create a very nice website with a map when like everyone can just, you know, and use this data. Imagine what relatives could find on you. Imagine that your grandma, also you told her that you will not eat her pie because you already, you don't hungry. And then she will find that you will order something on the Yandex food delivery just five minutes later. It will be, you know, bad. Okay, but you know, like, we are not care about privacy because we keep on the email. Email is not really private data, yeah? And here is the problem. The problem called big data. The main problem is that we can connect multiple 
data in puzzles to one big image. Imagine if like we have a Quran application and it has no your name. It has only your location and that fact that you're a Muslim. But then there is a like a data broker bought, brought another data from the social app, which already have the location and email together. And, in the, and they can combine this location and find that your email is this one. And then we are going to some big uh, government data leak and we'll find your true name. And so this, like, uh, this is a reality how people connect the data in the internet. And there is a very like, creepy example which bore me a lot. Like Google Analy uh, Analytics is used on the half of the internet. And it means that they are not only knows where like users on your site goes, they know the full like track of every user across the half of the internet, even more because they can use uh, data of where you click and the referrer, so they can uh, go to the like before and after uh, website. And you know it's it's really worrying me a lot. Okay, but you know like if you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to fear. Yeah. But first, like, there is a people who have something to, to hide. Like, an uh, ex-Twitter employee leaked a lot of the data to the Saudi government, and uh, this data uh, put a young woman to jail for the 34 years and old teacher to the death sentence. And if Twitter will not collect this, uh, did not collect this data, they wouldn't be in the jail or, like, in the death prison, the death sentence. And it's not only, you know, like American and like United States and uh, Arabic country problem, like in Netherlands, just, you know, close by countries, there is a company, Vision Lab, who sells a, a face recognition software to then find and arrest uh, anti-war Russian protesters. And the main problem is still operational, like there's no problem, like this, it, this is not a part of the sanction, you know, or like even like, if we will speak about the US citizen, it's also a problem because like, there is a very bad example. It was happened just a few months ago when a Spanish government forced Proton Mail to give them some data and they used it to put a man to the jail because he was part of uh, Catalan independence protests. But they was completely uh, peaceful and they do nothing. This was not a terrorist. But like if it, if that example did not convince you because you don't care about other people, there is another argument. If large language model will know your personal data, they will be twice more effective of changing your political views. And you know, it could, be, it could lead us to completely different society, and I really worry about it. Okay, what we can do? Who thinks that like web become an awful place with all these pop-ups? Like, they are everywhere. But you know, we are on the Dev Conference. And it's not internet became awful place. It's we as, as a developer made this awful place. So first step, if you have website, please remove GDPR pop-up. But you can say like, you know, but there is a government like Brussels force us to do it. In reality, you know, there is no world pop-up in the GDPR law. The GDPR law say only a simple thing, don't track your users. But we are so obsessed with data collections that we can do it. So we, like, we make our users suffer. So they, to like, stop this pain, will um, confirm with uh, tracking. And you know, I think it's not good, but okay. There is a much better way. First, you are going to GPR compatible analytics. There is a lot of them. And first, you remove pop-up. And second, you ask uh, personal data permission only in some relative places, for instance, in sign-up form, when user understand why he give you personal data. Uh, and analytics without pop-up analytics, it could co cookie-less analytics or GPR compatible analytics, it could do a lot. Of course, it could track the source of the traffic, it could track events, but most importantly, you can still track your campaign, like from the UTM links to the, for instance, uh, payment. You can still do it with a GDPR compatible analytics. There are two things you cannot do. First, you cannot like connect all visits with uh, some user ID, because this is like tracking by definition. You track where user go, and second one you can do you cannot do a very like bad from my perspective very 
shady thing which called remarketing. It's when you like your user visits the website, you remember his social media and start then special advertisement, like come back to your to our websites. I don't know, like, yep, you can do it, but this is shady practice for me. There is a lot of good tracking, uh, cookie less tracking. Uh, of, but of course, a lot of managers force you to use Google Analytics. But in reality, it's like more tricky because about half of the users press no on GDPR pop-up. Pop it means that your data is not unif uniform. Part of the data will uh, contain personal data, part of it's not, and it's not random. There is uh, reasons why one people goes to one directory and another and other people to another directory. And it means that without uni data uniformity, you cannot trust this data. From my perspective, it's much better to have completely uh, uniform data, even if you have a less data for each person, because you can trust this data. Otherwise, you have data only for the special half part of your users. And this is like not a business, it's just a maniac obsession of data collection. And you know, there's a practice of like, let's just not show the GDPR pop-up for like rest of the people, only for Europe. It will not work because right now we have similar law across the whole globe and it will be even more. And I really believe that we as, as an industry can really change the industry. We already did it when like after, uh, as a web developer, we killed Internet Explorer. And it was even conspiracy in the YouTube uh, dev team when they like, you know, um, they remove Internet Explorer support without really confirming it with uh, managers, and it forced the whole internet to switch because this like a one um, you know uh, one revolution make a big fire. Then reduce the data privacy data processors. I mean, like you know when you go to the GDPR pop up uh, and you see the real number of like, partners, and you know we really care about the privacy uh, because every company which you use, which like have some access to the users, could have private data of these users. For instance, public CDN, for instance, mail service, etc. every service. And what do I suggest? First, I suggest to not use public CDN for JavaScript libraries. It's really bad practice for the performance as well. Also, don't use CDN for the fonts. Try to self-host as much as you possible. It's not a problem, it's sometimes even cheaper. And try to combine uh, multiple features on the same platform and not like use each like new platform for every new feature. Sometimes 5% of the features is not like worse for the, the problem of the privacy. But the most important part here, it's local first. This is what I really believe and love. But it's advanced step. It's only for the new projects or very hard refactoring. We have like, initially we have local only software when everything was on the, your machine and it was no privacy problem there. But then iPhone. Okay. And as a result, because every user start to have uh, two devices, we start to use cloud. And by using cloud, we start to have a privacy problem because now there is a central place with all users' data. But there is a third way, uh, which I would suggest to you. It's a local first solution. It's a solution when we keep users' data on the device, but still we use server to synchronize this data. So we are not going to the past. We still have all modern features, but just with a better privacy. So. Uh, this idea was invented in Ink and Switch. Uh, there is a very good manifesto. I highly recommend to read it. It has a s seven ideas. My favorite one, like snow spinners, uh, offline first, like collaboration, conflict-free, etc. But I will explain this idea on the example. There is a notion, very popular tool to make notes. But all your notes in the cloud, they can read everything. In comparison, there is a competitor called uh, Obsidian, which keep every, all your nodes locally, not just locally, but in markdown files in one folder, so you can edit it with any text editor. And you, they have a server to synchronize your data across the devices, but it's optional. You can use GitHub repo, you can use any like, cloud provider, I, uh, um, iCloud, or you can use your own script. And this is a very good example of how we can make a new type of software. But it doesn't mean that every local first software should be like in this way. Of course, sometimes it's impossible to allow the user to choose the synchronization server. So like local first is a spectrum, it's not an on-off switch. We are welcome to you even if you start to just have a big cache on, on the device. It's still a very important step further. How to do it? I will 
explain from the perspective of the web development, but it's so pretty similar for the any other systems. So in local first, we have all data on the device. We can use we can use cloud, but it's optional. It means that we need uh, we will have about 50 megabytes or 500 megabytes data on the clouds, and it means that we have we need to have a very good database with good performance and rich query language. Of course, if you're a desktop developer, it's not a problem, but in the web, it's uh, more tricky. But there is a solution. There is a tool called WebAssembly. It's a way to compile any C++ program to, for the browser. And there is a SQLite port to the WebAssembly. And you, right now, you can run SQLite in the browser. It's not a problem. You can even run a Postgres server in the, in the browser. You can even uh, add a custom extension to this server. But it's in the development. So I highly recommend right now SQLite. They use two APIs. First, it's called uh, original private file system. It's a way for browser to like create a folder to the website and give this folder to the, your JavaScript. But another way, much more popular right now, is IndexedDB. Funny part, Firefox use SQLite for IndexedDB. So like when you put SQLite to your website, it stores the data in IndexedDB and it stores in SQLite. So you put SQLite inside of SQLite. Funny part, it's still much more it's much faster than just using IndexedDB because like IndexedDB is not a very good database. But then, then you need to have a log, a list of operation what user actually did. And uh, on the interface, you have a reactive store, some, I don't know, object, which will just initialize, initialize from the SQLite, but it will update from that log. Every time when something add an action to this log, it will update the stage, uh, it will update his uh, state, and it will update us uh, user interface. Uh, why we need this log? Because we will use this log for synchronization, and also it's very important to not, like, to be sure that you can, uh, to separate writes and reads, so everyone can write. For instance, other browser tabs, etc. Then you need two uh, passwords for for user, one will after authenticate you to the cloud, and second one will create encryption channel, so server will not be able to read anything. And the funny part that this architecture, which we created just because we have a principles, give us a very material benefits. First, it's very simple to write server because server do nothing almost. Second, you don't need server on the prototype state stage and it means that you can start early and get money earlier it's always good for business third it's very cheap to scale because uh, every time when you have a more users on the classic architectures the server will like have a more load but in the local first the clients will bring their own uh, power no pro no private data no leaks and it's much easier to develop because you separate synchronization code, networking, network, uh, network errors processing, and the business logic. And the most, my favorite one is that you, you have a zero latency because every, every data is here locally. And there is a lot of frameworks to do it in the JavaScript. But unfortunately, all this framework is not really production ready for every website. Reality. It's still it's good for some cases, but as a second problem, Migrations. It's hard to use to run migrations on the servers, but it's much harder to use it on the clients. And if you use end-to-end -end encryption, there is no password recovery, because, like you know, great privacy comes with great responsibilities. But again, local first is not a spectrum. If you can't implement the end-to-end -end encryption, it's still okay to just have a very to just keep data on the client. It will be still local first. And there is a good example, good businesses like Linear. A lot of people like them because they are fast and they are fast because of local first. Pitch, they have uh, about 2 million team. All like good notes, they have about 25 million users actively. And so it means that like local first can be production. But the last topic, a uh, very short. Uh, this is a topic uh, very advanced, mostly for the big companies. But it's very interesting. You know, like we have a very different private risks. Like, we have a problem with uh, be watched by government secret service, but also we have a problem by be watched by the family members, you know, like unlock your device by your hand while you're sleeping. But in the reality, United States people and United States journalism only focus on the problem important for the United States. So let's at little explore the, like how privacy works in a different part of the world. For instance, because the main problem is that sometimes when you work with one risk, 
improve the, like, reduce the one risk, you increase the another risk. For instance, I made a news feed uh, reader where you can re read news. And of course, in the United States, people will prefer to have local first. So this reader will ask the data from the news channel directly without a server. So I will not be able to, uh, to sell the, their data. But in Russia, people are more afraid about uh, internet provider. And they prefer to use clouds because with the cloud, the internet provider will, will not know that they are reading Navalny, for instance. Or another problem, which I'll, only a few people think, it's a random local police check. In Russia and, or below Russia, there is a like, local police who can ask you to unlock your Telegram channel and to check your uh, channels. And if you will, not ag if you will uh, agree, they will find something, can you go to jail? If not, they will break your legs. And uh, Belarusian cyber partisans, they create a very amazing fork of the Telegram when you can define uh, two different pins. And if you will enter the second pin, it will delete all, you know, dangerous channels. So summary, find your principles, don't work for money, remove GDPR pop-up by moving to the Google-less analytics, reduce services, think about local first for the next project, and think about uh, privacy risk in other countries. That's all, the contacts. Thank you, Andre. That was very interesting.